speaking about the theme of restoration. My purpose will be to not so much clarify what restoration is about, though I will attempt some of that. I think some of us need some reminders and clarifications along the way. But I'll be trying to encourage us to face up to some of the issues of restoration. Restoration is both a principle and a process. And it is possible to understand the principle without being involved in the process. So I'll be wanting to focus on some of the issues that are a part of the contemporary scene as we look at our movement, our historical movement. I think what I will do is, is outline for you what I intend or what I have at this moment planned for the three days so you can know where the entire series that I'm presenting will be going. Today's will be intensely personal. It will not consist of material that is in the book so much as it will consist of the sorts of questions that people have asked of me because of the book. It's sort of a personal apologia, I suppose. It at least will tell you something of the concerns that bring me to where I am in trying to call attention to some of the issues that, that this book speaks to. I do not presume to have taken a unique pilgrimage. I think mine is probably similar in scope to that which some of you have taken or are taking as members of this historical movement to understand our present status and our future prospects. Then tomorrow, I want to address the topic, what restoration offers our generation. Tomorrow I want to look at, at what I think is, is the viability of the restoration plea if we qu ever quit talking about it within our own walls, just among ourselves, and let people out there know what we really are about. The perception that many people have of us is incorrect, and yet I think we're responsible for their incorrect perception. A lot of them see us as a people whose goal is altogether negative. They know us in terms of, of what we are against. Restorationism is a very positive thing. And so tomorrow I want to talk about restorationism as something we ought to be articulating not just for ourselves. Now some of us are going to have to, to rethink what our mission is. That's sort of today's thing. But tomorrow, to say, here is how we can let people know what we are about, and here's what is attractive about that. And then on the last day, I want to address the theme of fellowship, which is where I think, in terms of present issues that we restorationists must talk about, we've got to talk about fellowship and how we can have fellowship across lines that traditionally have not just been lines for us, but have been walls and barriers. And how we can, in fact, have that fellowship without being compromisers, without selling out on anything that we regard to be true, or even anything on which we hold intensely uh, personal and deep convictions. So that's the game plan for the three days. Something of a personal preface today, what restoration offers our generation, the lecture tomorrow, and then the final day, fellowship without compromise. Jerry's already mentioned the book, I Just Want to Be a Christian, and I hope if you don't know the book, you'll get acquainted with it. Um, I don't presume there any more than in this series of lectures to say everything that needs to be said, but, but perhaps to raise some of the questions. And then another book that I can recommend in even greater generosity than certainly my own. A number of you know Monroe Hawley and are familiar with his book published several years ago, almost ten years ago now, Redigging the Wells. Monroe has written a new book which came off the press about five days ago. I have a personal copy, 20th Century published it. 
I think there will be copies on campus at uh, some of the bookstalls before the week passes. Monroe Hawley, The Focus of Our Faith. The subtitle, A New Look at the Restoration Principle. Monroe has, has done us another service with this book, and this book most definitely you should read if you have any interest in the Restoration Principle. Let me begin with a quotation that some of you have probably heard me use before. I think I used it when I was here last summer. The quotation is not from a religious writer. The quotation is from a sociologist. It speaks of the pattern of change that tends to occur from one generation to the next in institutions. And the institution here can can be a school, a labor movement, or it can be, in this context, a religious movement. The quotation. The first generation are the founding fathers. They joined together in intense and purposeful partnership at very difficult times. They paid a high price, risking reputation, investments, and even their lives for the sake of the institution. The second generation may have experienced some of the problems of the founders, by and large, they had only second-hand commitment and vision of the cause. The third generation loses vision, having known only the life of the institution. They are members in name only, not sure why the institution exists, and with minimal interest in keeping it going. By the fourth generation, traditions and habits are the only things that keep the doors open. That quotation from a sociologist about the, the general tendency of institutions bothers me when I think of the present status of the American Restoration Movement. I am a restorationist. My goal, however, is not to restore the Restoration Movement. As a restorationist, my goal is, is far greater than the movement itself. It seeks to go back to the New Testament church as conceived in the mind of God as executed through the apostles and prophets of the first century who had been personal participants in the life of Christ and who had been witnesses to his resurrection from the dead. And so when I say that I'm a restorationist, I am someone seeking in my life to be just a Christian. I don't care to be encumbered weighted down, fettered by the traditions and accretions, creeds and institutionalism, sectarian divisive postures that have crept into the Christian movement from its earliest days. And yet, frankly, I wonder sometimes if it is possible to be a restorationist. Can we ever fully escape the cultures of our time and, and the prejudices that we bring and the, and the provincialism that we may be guilty of in our thinking. But I know the ideal is right, and whether we can ever fully escape all the things that would hinder us to be what ideally we want to be, whether that's ever even possible or not fully. It's a goal worth keeping alive, and it's worth striving for. I even raise the question whether anyone can be just a Christian. Every Christian, including the Christians of that first century that I'd like to imitate, seem to have very often been more than just Christians. Certainly some at Corinth were. They were Christians with divisive allegiances within the body around Cephas, Apollos, and so on. Some of them had opinions that separated them from one another. Paul in Romans 14 said, be charitable with one another. I, I question whether even they were Christians in an absolutely pure sense. Jesus, I suppose is the only one whose faith has ever been totally pure. And all the rest of us from the apostles forward have tried to be his with varying degrees of obvious imperfection. Well, the American Restoration Movement arose in the early 19th century and pleaded for a return to the things that are, and this is fairly typical language, things that are fundamental, essential, and universal to the Christian religion. Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, other founding fathers of that movement were the first generation of this historical movement. Now, the theological movement acts, too. 
the historical movement of which we are heirs, the candles, the stones. They seem to have had a clear vision of their goal of calling people back to the New Testament church. And they had no idea of establishing a competitive denomination. They came to their vision through arduous personal study of Scripture and they had a defensible rationale for the program they had in mind. And they paid a high price for their dream. But they thought nothing more important than Christ and the gospel. Then came a second generation of people. They articulated the restoration plea, but they did it from the perspective of a second-hand vision. They still held most of the same positions the founding fathers had held, but some of its leaders had neither the clear-headed understanding of the rationale for those positions nor the ability to establish all the particular, clu- uh, particular conclusions that they still said they held. And then to the third and fourth generations of the American Restoration Movement. Traditions, habits, and I fear the life of the institution itself had had come to dominate. And today, apathy and fragmentation, divisiveness and sectarian attitudes are threatening to destroy what was once a dynamic movement. That's certainly the case that my brief overview of historical developments from the standpoint of this sociologist's perspective on institutions in general is is terribly brief and involves a great deal of interpretation, and certainly there are exceptions to my generalizations. I'm sure there were some in the first generation of this movement who had a confused conception of restorationism, and probably are some today who have a very clear concept of restoration, but I'm talking about general trends. I think we've lost something, especially of that ironic spirit that was a lovely part of the restoration movement early on, where men could recognize one another as brethren and treat one another in a brotherly way, even though they disagreed. I think we've lost some of that, but I'll say more about that on Friday. The challenge of this series of of lectures is to to get some of us who are well down in terms of generations from the founding fathers, either theologically, well removed from the first century, or historically, heirs now to that movement begun in the 19th century, to rethink who we are. We're having an identity crisis. And if we don't get clear on our identity, we are going to degenerate into nothingness, and we're going to deserve to do that. Now, God's church is not going to degenerate and die. The contribution we wanted to make to the preservation and restoration of that church, that may come to an end, but the church of Jesus Christ will not die. I believe the promise of Jesus, that the powers of... Hades did not prevail against his church, either his intent to establish it or, as I understand that passage, that church even through the ages. Well, anyone who has ever written a book knows what an intensely personal experience it is, and there's something of a love-hate relationship. There's something the writer wants to say, but there are always hurdles in his path. Research on complex topics, that's a hurdle. Time for writing is another. The sheer challenge of expression, still another. I've experienced and dealt with all these things several times before in writing other books on other topics, but but this book that I'm speaking from, this material that I'm using as backlog for what I'll say in these three days has been very different from any other book I've ever written. As a matter of fact, it has been such an intensely personal experience that that I chose today in getting into the material to run the risk of doing something of an autobiographical statement. The book has been written, this lecture is given, with something of a sense of both pain and danger. The pain of writing a book like that relates to several factors, some theological and some too personal even for me to put into words. Yet I feel compelled to try to verbalize something of it because I think it might help some of you verbalize and deal with some of your own feelings. This book offers criticism of something I love. It's not a pleasant thing to be involved in the process of criticizing. 
and certainly not something that you love. And some who have heard the criticism have attributed the criticism to hatred, and they have attacked my devotion to the fellowship of believers with whom I am associated. They would as legitimately castigate my love for my children in view of the fact that I sometimes have to criticize them. Some criticism is destructive and sometimes is motivated by unworthy sentiments. There have been epithets hurled and books written by people who were leaving our brotherhood. And they have been very critical of our fellowship because they were through with it and they were turning their backs on it. They sounded bitter and cynical because they were. They offered nothing positive as an alternative for what they were criticizing, what they were fed up with. They were simply saying goodbye in despair. Some of them might have been kept or reclaimed if we had dealt with them in a gentler, better way. Because even when duty calls for correction and rebuke, there still must be, according to Paul, great patience and careful instruction rather than castigation and harshness. But to castigate and be harsh has, for a time at least, I think we're past that point as a brotherhood at large, that seems to have been pretty much the manner of response to criticism of any sort. We're so prone to begin our rebuke with public exposure and threats or even excommunication. But if that's the case, let no one be surprised that outsiders don't see us as the present day, 20th century extension of the ministry of Jesus. Look at the way he dealt with Peter. Very different from the way we sometimes deal with a person that we believe has failed. Sometimes they don't see us as the restoration of the work that Paul did. Witness the way Paul dealt with doctrinal and moral problems at Corinth. We don't have a church among us that has the problems Corinth had. But I don't see Paul either starting a paper or using one already in existence to lambast it and write it up. Yeah. On the other hand, criticism can be offered which is designed to be constructive and which has been motivated by love. And that sort of criticism is not wicked. And that sort of criticism can accomplish good. <coughs> Even if one loves his children more than his own life, as I do, there are some times that I have to challenge the behavior of those children. And the child may not perceive my love, but I still have to speak and act in what I believe is the child's best interest and run the risk of being misunderstood for a time. Well, the criticisms that I have offered of our brotherhood are most often, I think, self-criticisms, to be honest. I once moved among and was applauded by the people who are now my most violent critics. And though not a fortune teller, I looked ahead before speaking or writing on these matters and foresaw the men in the papers and the geographical areas from which the quick and severe reaction would come. And there have been very few surprises, either in the persons or the positions that have surfaced. I've sat in their council meetings, and I know the strategy. I, too, have in time past refused to hear and hurled my theological missiles and have thought myself contending for the faith all the while. I deserve the fate I've suffered at their hands because it's only right to reap as you've sown. If that's not in the Bible, it ought to be. Though many of the things I've had to say about a sectarian spirit, though some of the things I've had to say about smug self-righteousness and the like have primarily been self-criticisms, they have been taken as personal attacks by some of those from whose company I've sought consciously to, to sever myself, at least in terms of doing the work I once did. Perhaps it could have been no other way, either for me or for them, I don't know. There's been no small amount of pain involved in thinking through a number of topics which others have been allowed by my intellectual lethargy to decide for me. Nothing is easier Nothing is more comfortable than to let someone else do your thinking. 
All you have to do is buy the pennant at the appropriate stand and then find you a place along the parade route and wave your pennant. Working from uninformed dogma to personal conviction, though, from traditional posture to informed faith, requires a great deal of openness and much more humility than I was ever accustomed to. To question the, the predominant sentiment of one's subculture is not an easy thing for a Jew or a Roman Catholic or a Baptist or someone who had been reared within the churches of Christ in the Deep South in the 1950s. I grew up, I'm afraid, more interested in the party line at times than in the truth. And a few preachers had more influence on me than the Word of God. And it was my fault more than theirs. I learned to think as they thought, believe as they believed, and preach as they preached, and I advanced beyond many of my own age and background. I spoke in-house jargon to the appreciation of those who already believed all that I did, and it was comfortable. Finally, it dawned on me that preaching on the small range of issues important to my own kind and the coded language we were accustomed to use and with a harsh manner toward all who dared disagree, even within our own brotherhood, was wrong. Even if I was right on every topic, the spirit of setting all others at naught and considering only those like me the faithful church was ungodly. As I looked at the larger world of needy humanity outside my own fellowship, I wondered, why don't they hear this message I'm preaching? Why don't, why don't they hear of and love the Christ? And it began to dawn on me why they weren't hearing. It was a spirit of pharisaical smugness with which I was going to them that made it impossible for them to hear. The fault was mine, not theirs. Even to speak of the sort of spiritual struggle that I've been going through smacks of a new form of arrogance if it is not taken rightly. It can come across as simply shifting ground and now setting at naught those who set all others at naught. After all, nothing's more inconsistent than the person who's trying to show tolerance to everybody except the person who's intolerant. <laughs> And I intend nothing of that sort because that's not the spirit with which the book was written or with which my ministry is unfolding. I'd like to have better relationships with those people than they will allow. But the lines tend to be drawn very quickly. In fact, over the past couple of years, an inordinate amount of my time has been spent trying to talk to and clarify positions for those who who had been critical. And I repeat, I tell you of my personal struggle only to help someone unaware of it. To know how someone who's been so sectarian in spirit can presume to speak against what he once exemplified so well. It's a humiliating thing. And it is a difficult thing. The attacks from a few have been painful to bear, and the attacks have been from a few. The general response to, to this book really has, has been overwhelmingly positive, and I, I have no apology to make for having written it at all. The general response has been precisely as follows. I'm glad to hear someone else say, now even from a pulpit, what I have believed for, and then the variation is for the number of years for three years, or 25 years, or 40 years, or 60 years. Or, as, as a great number of people have said to me, to be saying again what I always heard said when I was young. Dr. White told me a few moments ago, he said, I can't imagine uh, the boo-ha that, that that book's called. said, when I was young, that's what I always heard, and that's what I believed. But a generation of us came along where some of those early restoration attitudes were neglected and where the doctrinal postures were emphasized with such rigor that a spirit that would allow study 
and would facilitate teaching and learning was abandoned. And then a final element of pain in writing this book and in speaking on this topic has been the recent death of my father. Shortly after I'd completed the second of three drafts that the book went through, my dad entered the hospital, had exploratory surgery, and was found to have cancer of the pancreas. He'd worked up until the morning before he was admitted to the hospital. Had a little abdominal distress, thought he'd better have the doctor check it out. He lived three and a half weeks. He was never able to return home from the hospital. I spent as many of those days, precious days, good days, the best days we ever had together with my father. My mother, two brothers, and I were beside his bed in rotation or together for every moment during those three and a half weeks. His mind was clear and sharp, and his concerns for the needs of his wife and children were still greater than his concerns for himself. He showed the dignity and the grace and the faith of a, of a Christian, knowing all that we knew about his condition and his prospects that were exemplary and that will always live as reminding me that, that he was at his best at that moment. But we spent several hours in those last three and a half weeks going over the manuscript of this book. And I discussed every major point in it with him. He taught me. He encouraged me. He challenged me. And the third draft reflects a great deal of his contribution. Nothing in the book startled him because he'd grown up at the feet of both A.G. Freed and N.B. Hardiman. He attended three years of high school and two years of college under them from 1921 to 26. And it's amazing. If you go back and read the literature of the 1920s, the things that are said in my book of Monroe's are very tame, very conservative. Because something of that early spirit of restoration was still around then. It was around 1930 that a corner was turned. He met and married my mother during her two years of college under the same two teachers, 1924 to 26. And Daddy's only chagrin over the points made in this book was in the realization of how far in just one lifetime, his, our brotherhood had strayed from what had been its glorious heritage. His final request of me was that I complete and publish the book without being intimidated by the opposition that we both knew it would generate among a few. Thus the book is dedicated to him, as you'd notice on the flyleaf. So the book has been written in something of a sense of pain. The book, I also said, has been written with a certain sense of danger. And what does that imply? Well, there's certainly the danger that the destructive critics of the church, the church I love, would try to exploit my criticisms for their purpose, to harm the body. And while that's a danger, I don't think it can be prohibitive because a far greater danger, it seems to me, would be to allow a situation to develop or maybe to go unchallenged where people must choose, must choose on the one hand between prejudiced loyalty to the status quo in this brotherhood and the destructive criticisms that usually end in bailing out on the whole thesis of restorationism. I'd like to say there's a third option. I, I'm attempting to choose the third option, and I encourage it to you. While looking back over our biblical and historical heritage, we need not think that blind loyalty or total repudiation exhaust the possibilities. The other course of action open to us is we can build on our strengths, and we have many. We can engage in honest self-examination, and we need to. We can learn where we're ignorant, and there are some spots. And we can humble ourselves before God and men, and that's the hardest part, and move confidently toward the unity and harmony of faith that the New Testament encourages. That's a middle ground 
between the postures of loyalty to the status quo and bailing out on restorationism. You see, I, I'm not cynical or bitter or waving goodbye. My roots are here. My heart is here. I'll die here. But while I live, I want to try to contribute something positive and constructive. One brother said his philosophy had always been, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And his comment was intended as a rebuke to me of, of my, as he put it, troublesome questions and criticisms. And perhaps more clearly than he intended, he put the reason for going ahead with the project, even against the sense of pain and danger. Because the ideal of restoring New Testament Christianity has, among some, been replaced with the less than spiritual goal of preserving the status quo. Something has gotten broken. And we need to fix it. What once was a vibrant, dynamic movement that had great appeal to the people who heard about it is very often despised in the places where we are known best. Churches of Christ are not growing generally. Our image in the parts of the U.S. where we are best known is quite poor. And we are so splintered over so many issues from instrumental music to church cooperation to translations of scripture to the number of communion cups to whether or not to have Sunday school classes that nobody, nobody in his right mind can take us seriously as a unity movement. And yet we try to bill ourselves that way. No wonder we don't get a hearing. There is a way to practice unity, but I think we've forgotten a way to have fellowship and not compromise and still be to the world something attractive. And, and on Friday, I, I really intend to try to realizing that, that all these brethren were here that I didn't know about. <laughs> here are people in the non-institutional segment of our brotherhood. Disparagingly, generally termed antis, in case you don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> non-institutional brethren. Okay? A lot of people don't know who I'm talking about when I use that term. I don't use the other term. It's derisive. It was invented as a derisive term. It has been used as a derisive term, and it's part of the vocabulary that has fostered our divisions. We've got to quit it. Use it only to disparage the term as a term of reference and not to use it. We need to have more of the sorts of meetings with those brethren that you took the lead in here on the West Coast to have recently. There are some things broken. But God's in the fixing business. And I think in this generation, some things are going to be fixed. Some things are going to be changed. If we are not at the heart of doing it, God will raise up somebody else to do it. It may be the Community Bible Church. It may be a group unnamed, unidentified, unaffiliated. It may be some movement to rise up within the Baptist Church, as Campbell's movement did. Or within the Presbyterian Church, as Campbell's movement originally did. I don't know where the sensitive people will have their hearts touched by God and His Word and where they'll begin taking it seriously. But if we quit taking it seriously, somebody else's heart will be captured by this ideal. It can't be beaten down. The question is not, will God do it? The question is, will we be part of it? I don't want to be a hindrance anymore. The pain and sense of danger attached to the raising of these issues is outweighed by the peril of not developing a clearer concept of our identity and purpose and methodology. I'm concerned about young people. I have spent several years in teaching at Christian colleges and in counseling young people. But all those thousands of young people that I've had in classes are outweighed by three that live at my house. 
a daughter who's 20 and sons who are 15 and, or, or sons who are 17 and 13. Young people appear to see their options relative to what I will call the Yellow Pages Church of Christ in a couple of ways. And, and let me explain my terminology. By Yellow Pages Church of Christ, I mean our amillennial non-instrumental fellowship, okay? Multi-cup usually with Sunday school. The, the Yellow Pages Church of Christ. <laughs> to be distinguished from the Church of Christ as that term is used in a purely biblical sense. Now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Yes, I believe the Yellow Pages Church of Christ is a part of the New Testament Church of Christ, but I don't believe our membership role is exhausted. Because in the Yellow Pages, my brethren from the independent Christian churches have a separate listing, but they're in the Church of Christ in the New Testament sense. They are my brethren. Brethren that I believe have some problems, but as they look over here, they say, you've got some problems. <laughs> and I suspect we're both right. And I suspect if we did more talking together than talking about, we'd be blessed. But I use that term and say I'm concerned about young people seeing their options relative to the Yellow Pages Churches of Christ in a couple of ways. First, some are trying to decide whether or not to stay within their family and personal heritage to this point. They see pettiness, majoring in minors, church politics. Many are too sensitive to be a part of it, and they go looking for something better, and so they try the Baptist church or the Community Bible church. Others have just dropped out altogether. They've quit. They've at least been convinced by their parents, here is where the action of God is happening, and they say, well, if this is the best action God has, I don't want any. And that scares me. And if you'll just compare the enrollment of your first grade Sunday school class with that of your seventh grade, or if you want a real shock, your twelfth grade class, which probably has been combined with everybody from the ninth grade up in order to have a class... <laughs> You might get insight as to whether any of that's going on where you are. It is a fortunate young man or woman who's a member of the congregation among us where the perception is one of a warm, committed to the Lord, caring for the lost, supporting for the hurting, meaningful group in fellowship body. They're fortunate. Those who decide to stay within us are sometimes forced to choose between, on the one hand, dead, cold churches and what I'll call new wave evangelistic churches. The former are perceived as funeral parlors with old people sitting around the corpse waiting for the burial. <laughs> the latter generate excitement and win most of the young people. But they tend to regiment life around one ministry and to judge one's worthiness only in his success in recording baptisms and tend at times to leave as casualties a string of people who can't measure up to the expectations of their white-hot excitement. And yet having said that, as, as the options that, that our young people see, we ought not cut off either of those groups either. The dead, lifeless, old, cold churches. I believe God can still rejuvenate. And some churches that have a methodology and even to some degree a theology that frightens me because of the harm I've seen done, I don't want to cut them off and make them a separate fellowship from us. They are my brethren too. I'd like for us somehow to be a large enough body, a large enough fellowship that we can complement, bless, mature and enhance the faith of one another by some interaction rather than isolating and fragmenting ourselves and only throwing salvos over into each other's camps every once in a while to prove that within your own camp you're sound because you salvoed. <laughs> Daniel Borston Librarian of Congress since 1975 and a, winner, and a winner of the Pulitzer Prize for a volume on American history 
has made an observation that seems relevant here in discussing something of this personal question, yet I've tried to enlarge it now to say, but really, I'm a part of it with you. I think we're all on this pilgrimage together. Borston made an observation that I think is relevant. He says, quote, the disciples of discoverers are enemies of discovery. Close quote. The American Restoration Movement began as an exercise in discovery. Bright men with open minds look to Scripture in an effort to discern the will of God and distinguish that divine will from human accretions or departures and to practice the divine will without being encumbered by those accretions and departures. And they urge their pupils to be open-minded and to keep pressing the search but some of those pupils and students, second-generation restorationists, turned the ideas of the first-generation founding fathers into dogma. And the exciting sense of discovery and restoration began to give way to the dull, confining task of maintaining the approaches to spiritual knowledge now regarded as traditional and sacred within the group. Socrates loved ancient Athens but he was distressed in his belief that what had made Athens great was being abandoned by most of his own generation. And so he went on a mission that he said was divine and the gods sent him on. Ironic in view of the fact that he was put to death for atheism, isn't it? But he went on a task that he said the gods had given to him, saying that Athens was like a powerful but sluggish horse. He described himself as the gadfly of Athens, and he saw his mission in terms of stinging the city, not to hurt it, but to awaken it. I think Jesus undertook a similar role in a different context when he challenged the Jews of his time. The law of Moses and the life of faith it called for had been replaced by the orthodoxy of Judaism, the legalistic lifestyle dictated to the Pharisees. The Lord didn't repudiate the law, and the Lord didn't challenge the interpretations of the Pharisees on any of the major points of law of which I'm aware where his teaching and theirs was ever put in parallel. He did challenge, however, their willingness to substitute orthodoxy for a living faith. He did challenge their smugness within their group security. We are the children of Abraham. Every generation, every generation, has to be urged to rethink its basic beliefs and fundamental commitments. Whether it's Athens, challenged by Socrates, or the Jews of Jesus' day, challenged about that faith they'd veered away from so far in 1,500 years. And there are a few Socrateses or Jesuses, whatever the plural is, who will appear in history to challenge whole civilizations to the task. I certainly don't think we have any. But perhaps if enough of us who are at best devoted followers rather than charismatic leaders will begin thinking, discovering again, growing again, being honest with the biblical text again, searching for truth rather than confirmation of a position already derived, maybe a more general revival will occur among us. To quote Borston again, the great obstacle to progress is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. Until we're humble enough to resume learning, we're not disciples of the Son of God. Openness precedes learning and truth. And you're not open if you're afraid even to listen to what the other person has to say. If you're intimidated by the prospect of coming together to talk. What we thought was right all along may or may not be right after all. Only honest investigation can tell. If what we have been taught is right, our personal study will do us good. It will transform our tradition into genuine living faith. And if anything we've been taught is wrong, we do ourselves a favor to realize it was wrong and to quickly move away from it. Otherwise, you're a sectarian. David Lipscomb wrote a beautiful article about the difference between a sectarian and a truth seeker. And he said a sectarian defends his position at all costs. 
even at the cost of blinding himself to truth. But the truth seeker, Lipscomb said, is willing to be challenged. And he's willing to change if he must. We've never hesitated to challenge our Presbyterian or Baptist neighbors to lay aside prejudice and study for yourself. <laughs> and we must not hesitate to display the virtue that we call for in others. The overriding thesis of what I've had to say, I suppose, boils down to the fact that it's more an attitude than it is a set of beliefs that creates a sectarian spirit and that we've got to guard against with such conscious effort. In rethinking my own beliefs, I'm not aware of having moved away from any of the fundamental doctrines that I've held since late adolescence. I still believe in the saving work of God through Christ. I still believe in the one faith and the one church. Yeah, I still believe instrumental music is wrong. And yeah, I still believe you can use multiple containers in the Lord's Supper. But my understanding of Christ and the nature of His redeeming work is better than it was 20 years ago. And the relative priority of certain beliefs that have always been present in my concept of Christianity has been altered. Because I once thought the doctrine of instrumental music was more crucial to understand and preach than the doctrine of divine grace. My present understanding reverses the priorities. And while still believing both items and that each item must be developed at the appropriate stage of the person's spiritual growth. Understanding Christ is at the top. Preaching about, as, as one of the titles, and I forget whose title it is, I love your title. I'll steal it when I go home. One of the sessions, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. I like that one. But you see, I grew up under and I learned to preach with steam coming out of both nostrils about sinners in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> and there is a side of my God's character that can be moved to great severity. But you have to provoke God to that sort of anger. That is not His natural bent and disposition toward us sinners. God's wrath against sinners comes when having had a display of grace again and again and again, that person willingly and defiantly shakes his hand in the face of God to reject it. But I'm afraid, as I first learned of God, grace was, as one brother recently defined it, you doing all you can and God taking up the slack. And thinking that that was the hope that we had of escaping the horrible yawning pit and the fiery flames. No wonder I was insecure. And no wonder I was scared to death. And no wonder I was spoiling for a fight. I didn't know God... Grace is not God's taking up the slack of what you can't do. Grace is God doing everything. Amen. If you could do anything that was any better than filthy rags in the eyes of God, we'd all want to watch you and stand and applaud. God himself would get up from, from the throne. We are sinners. And grace is not our doing nine-tenths and God filling in the gap. Grace is the cross. And that's the beginning point for me now. And to understand God, His nature, His character, His love, His grace, as exhibited personally through Jesus Christ, and as recorded in propositions in Scripture, there is the beginning point now. And the other things about a theory of the millennium, or about Sunday schools, or about church treasuries. 
and I can't even find that in my strongs. <laughs> Those things that, that at, at times were at the front end and where in one congregation near where I live now, when a person presents himself to place membership, they check him out on a long list of things, including the use of the church treasury. Those things now are not at the top of the list. They are matters for study and growth and maturity and even for divergence and yet fellowship. If you don't come to the same conclusion I do about the number of cups you can have in the Lord's Supper or where you can send money out of your church treasury or even about the instrument, you act with good faith before God and intellectual and spiritual integrity. And you don't have to let me do your thinking for you before I will acknowledge you as a brother, even if I believe you're a brother who's wrong about something. And while in some of those things you and I may not be able to, to share, it may be a worship service where the instrument is being used, or it may be, in the one case, our helping with a work that you choose not to help in, we do not have to ignore all the other areas, which are even priority issues over those, that we do hold in common and where we are in fellowship through Christ. I don't envy the man who says he hasn't changed his views on any topic in his adult life. <laughs> on the other hand, I'm not jealous of the confused soul who regularly jettisons his entire belief network and has no continuity to his spiritual life. And somewhere in between those two extremes, we all stand, don't we? In my own case, no repudiation of the basic beliefs, but study and reordering of priorities and alterations of understanding within a relatively stable web of belief. And against the insistence of my critics who see me as having changed so drastically, I can only say that I prefer to change than to persist in a belief or attitude that I now believe to have been wrong. So, the materials that I'm going to present which have more thrust in terms of, of doctrines and theology tomorrow and the next day, grow out of this. A sense of struggle and pain and danger and yet concern. And I have no desire to be a maverick or to lead a movement. Although I've spoken earlier about the negative reaction of a few brethren, the overwhelming reaction of my brethren has been positive and encouraging. And I'm not looking for anybody to follow me, only to think about these matters for himself. And on the other hand, I certainly have no longing for martyrdom either. I simply want to promote personal study and personal faith around important topics. And if I can help achieve that purpose, it will have been worth the sense of pain, the sense of danger, the sense of personal struggle for three children who live at my house, whose faith is forming in a much healthier way than mine had formed at their ages, or for someone who may read the book somewhere, or for you for attending this or subsequent lectures. And if any of that comes out of it that's good and positive, the rest will have been worthwhile. Thank you for struggling with me through an hour of very autobiographical material. And I hope on Thursday and Friday you'll want to pursue the other issues with me. Thanks for being here.